You'd rather have accelerators instead of cores? Psh, more like accelerating right into the trash, right? <laughs> Intel has made some big bets on what they call accelerators. And the war for market share in the data center is just starting to get uh, a little bit vicious, if we're being honest. AMD could actually have a bigger threat on their hands than they realize if anyone you know, successfully executes on uh, Intel's vision, or uh, Intel executes on their vision. I know, I know, Sapphire Rapids-based CPUs are out now, and the chips seem to be down for the count for Intel. But what Intel's already been doing with accelerators for years now, five, ten years plus for some of these, and how they fit in going forward is not well understood by many, and the messaging from Intel themselves is muddy at, at best. I have been eyeball deep in this super micro big twin system. It's a 221BT DNTR chassis that has four of the highest end Sapphire Rapid CPUs that you can get right now. And that's across two nodes that are both in this chassis. I did a full review on that with benchmarks and everything else in a video. You should definitely check that out if you're interested in the performance metrics. But the workloads I tested, a few of them were accelerated and the ones that were sort of blew my mind. And there's a lot going on and the deeper I dove, the more interesting things I found out. So let's talk about accelerators and how, if you've got them, you'd be crazy not to use them. Two times faster? Pfft. 10 times faster without using any extra CPU resources? Like your CPU utilization is not any higher? Yeah, that's what's going on and it's a big deal. Intel's accelerators messaging is weird. It's apparent even Intel's own people don't understand what they're trying to do or the messaging that they're trying to convey. I mean, just look at their YouTube videos. There's like 356 views. I'm not, uh, I'm not even sure that I understand it. And it's possible, I mean, okay, look at OpenVINO from my own review benchmarks. Nothing on the planet currently competes with this. It's in a whole other field. It's, it's in the stratosphere. Why isn't this huge news? This is, this is amazing. This actually isn't even a new feature. It's just a better, faster implementation of something they've already had since like 2017, 2018. It entered the Linux kernel years ago. Intel's own messaging around accelerators and what they do and how they can help has not, it's not been fabulous. I mean, Look at this headline from Tom's Hardware. Intel officially introduces pay-as-you-go licensing. Ooh. Oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. You don't have the fastest CPUs right now. Now's not really the time to introduce pay-as-you-go licensing. Uh. And Amazon? Amazon is doing really well with their Graviton ARM-based CPUs. <laughs> Those are CPUs that they're not even being considered for Intel in the first place anymore. So, I, you know, now's maybe not the time for that. So just going around talking about pay-as-you-go licensing could rightly spook potential adopters and may actually slow adoption of those types of features in the CPU. But, like Tom said, we don't have all the details. And here we are six months later from the time of that article, the time that I'm making this video, and the messaging here has been disjointed and strange, to say the least. The accelerator talk has been overshadowed uh, just by the the, the the fact that bog standard compute on the core, well, AMD's kind of in the lead right now for both raw compute speed per core, but also performance per watt, which is pretty important in the data center, especially when you pull accelerators out of the equation. You look at that, and whatever happened with one API? I mean, I heard it in the context of leveraging accelerators, but how does that fit? Well, I've been working on this for the last two months, three months, playing with all the different software stacks, trying to get everything to go, and it's, it's been a journey. Well, what about Quick Assist and the in-memory analytics accelerator? I mean, those are important. Those can do work without actually using a CPU core, and how they do that is really interesting and not well conveyed in Intel's messaging, but more on that in a minute. I mean, here's this video from Intel about in-memory analytics and RocksDB. I'm so skeptical about all of these accelerators, or I understand people's skepticism, because it seems like marketing material. I mean, there's not a lot of technical information in these videos, and there are some PDFs, but it's more marketing speak than anything else. And now, six months later, since the Tom's article, 
there's Sapphire Rapid CPUs you can get your hands on and you can actually do stuff, but there's also workstation CPUs for Sapphire Rapids. There's actually four unlocked Xeons. You can overclock a Xeon. I, you know, I, Intel literally didn't send anybody those CPUs at the time that I'm shooting this video. If you Google benchmarks for the W2400, it's almost like they're ashamed of it. I mean, there's only been one unlocked Xeon before those, the W3175X, and I had an absolute blast with that. 28 cores, six memory channels, truly an enthusiast's high-end desktop CPU. I diagnosed my mysteriously dead Asus Dominator motherboard with a level one diagnostic, and I replaced that motherboard with a top tier EVGA SR3 Dark, which I love and I still use today for a Linux system. But how weird was that CPU? There was really only one unlocked CPU for that socket, and the one thread performance uh, wasn't really that awesome, even though you could overclock it to five gigahertz. And that processor, was the one that Intel showed on stage in 2018 running at 5 gigahertz. Uh, that was pretty exciting, coming so fast after X299. But in retrospect, this processor did not age well. But why this matters now in the context of talking about accelerators is the press footage and coverage, the stuff that Intel gave us, was the same picture of how the CPU was put together, but the labeling on some of the stuff was different. They took out accelerators. I mean, it's still an absurd amount of silicon, but if we look at the actual accelerators page, there's a lot of stuff here that's actually not disabled in the CPU, the one 2400 series CPU that I do actually have. And you know, technically, AMX is and is not an accelerator. Functions around an accelerator can use instructions like AVX 512 and AMX. Those really live on a processor core, but that's in the accelerator part of an accelerator, not the core. And so I don't know if it's really technically correct to explain it this way, but that's how I'm going to explain it this way for this video. Intel Quick Assist. I've got a PCIe card that I borrowed from Microsoft SQL MVP Glenn Berry. It's a PCIe card, a peripheral. That's an accelerator. With that type of an accelerator, the CPU copies data via the PCIe bus and then gets the data back almost as fast as it copies it via the PCIe bus. That's the accelerator. Now think about that in the context of something else like direct storage. You're probably familiar with direct storage, but if not, it's a game process that allows a GPU to directly access some texture memory or whatever that's stored on, say, an NVMe storage device. That's kind of the promise that comes out of some of this, or that's kind of the end game for some of these accelerators that we see like with quick assists but for the context of this video when we're talking about quick assist and sql it's really just a peripheral that's implemented as kind of memory mapped io a block of data is read in and is copied to a region in memory and then the processor literally doesn't do anything it just waits on the accelerator to operate on that region of memory it does it on its own and then it says okay processor i'm done and then the processor looks in that region of memory and reads the data back. That's how the accelerator works, or at least the accelerator in this context. But Intel uses the term accelerator really loosely, and sometimes accelerator doesn't refer to that type of peripheral, so it can get confusing. Now the difference is this isn't a PCIe card in Sapphire Rapids. They live inside the CPU. No PCIe card required, but it still works largely the same way. Now our two Sapphire Rapids processors per node mean that I have four quick assist devices in our super micro chassis. It's no wonder that everyone is on about the huge size and the number of transistors in modern CPUs because we've taken all these PCIe peripherals and crammed them into the CPU. That's gonna use a lot of silicon real estate, it makes sense. And this is how the accelerator doesn't really use any CPU. I mean, it uses the CPU to copy data into a buffer and then wait for a signal. I mean, okay, that's fine. But that really only cr increases the CPU load a few percentage points. And you'll see that in pretty much all of the demos that are just demoing Quick Assist. This is kind of fascinating. And I've got another video coming up with uh, Glenn Berry, Intel's Accelerators Explained, where we look specifically at Microsoft SQL Server MSSQL and use Quick Assist. Other than Quick Assist, remember VROC, Virtual Raid on Chip? This is a similar mechanism under the hood, and that's one reason why Intel's software, not exactly sort of kind of RAID, with VROC is so much better than storage device RAID on the AMD platform. VROC is 60% ordinary software and 40% that Quick Assist style hardware acceleration. And that's where Sapphire Rapids really shines. It's obvious that Intel put a lot of work into this in this next generation. Intel's accelerators page is, uh, it's not great. It's not fabulous. 
For the AI acceleration, they talk mainly about AMX and AVX 512. Those are in the core, and AMX is legit awesome. Intel has undersold it, if that's possible. It seems like that would be impossible in this scenario with what I'm complaining about. But they've really muddied the water by suggesting that it's going to fall under the accelerators umbrella that may someday have pay to unlock licensing. AVX 512 is here, and it's here to stay. And it's an improved AVX 512 in Sapphire Rapids, and it no longer requires downclocking. There's not really a downside to it. These really are core level functions and not accelerators like how Quick Assist is an accelerator. But, you know, I'm not even sure that the actual pay thing will be something that you can do. For AI, I could kind of see it on the Habana side with Gaudi 2. You know, that's a separate chip AI accelerator, but I actually found stuff in Sapphire Rapids which would help effortlessly shuttle data between the internal CPU stuff of Sapphire Rapids and, you know, Gaudi 2 at those blistering PCIe 5 speeds. And so, okay, that's something, and then maybe you're gonna pay for Gaudi 2. That kind of makes sense, maybe. For high performance compute, well, that, this page adds DSA, which, at least on Linux, borrows and extends some of the plumbing from the virtual rate on chip type functionality and even dates from 2019. It's newer, faster, better, stronger in Sapphire Rapids, sure, but I feel good knowing that DSA type tech is tried and true in the Linux kernel and, like AVX 512, legit awesome. Now, a while back, I did a video on the absolute state of RAID in the enterprise, and spoiler, it is a dumpster fire. But the strongest steel is forged in the worst dumpster fires. No, okay, yep, yeah, kind of. That's, that's kind of true here. One of the interesting uses of DSA is that it can offer a zero overhead CPU way to automatically compute checksums for the data integrity field on NVMe devices in RAID and then write that checksum data to the actual integrity field on an NVMe device. That's a big deal. That's huge. For virtualization, it can provide some primitives to do things like accelerated virtualized interrupts for both networking and storage. And that sounds like word salad, but basically it means a virtualized network card can run as fast as a real network card. You don't have to pack in 100 network cards in a VM. It'll run perfectly fine with CPU accelerated networking, which means you don't have to buy a $2,000 network card. But more importantly, I don't think there's any chance that an accelerator like DSA is going to be monetized separately. It just it doesn't make sense. Uh, some of the functions I've described, checksums, compression, decompression, all of that stuff really technically does bleed over into something else that Intel has, which is called in-memory analytics, IAA, with even more extensions for doing compression and decompression. Wait a minute, I thought you were going to say it bleeds over into Quick Assist for compression and decompression. Yeah, it also bleeds over into Quick Assist too. It kind of does. It, all of these things are different ways of describing similar things for doing compression, decompression, and whatever, but under the hood they actually are subtly different. It has to do with the implementation. It's also true that some of the stuff they're calling, you know, under the IAA umbrella, they haven't historically said it was under the IAA umbrella, but, you know, now it is. Now, that video, remember the video of the, the demo of the Rocks DB? That does use some of the IAA features to do that scan operation, for example. You've got a big database, it's a huge thing, it's in memory. How do we find the needle in the haystack? Well, if you can just have some part of the CPU go find the needle, then you don't have to have the rest of the CPU be busy worrying about that. So, as a dev in a company, why wouldn't you be climbing the walls to implement these features? It, it boggles the mind. When I unlocked the arcane knowledge, it was like, oh, this is fun. And there's open source on GitHub, like the QAT zip libraries, and I can just import that, and it's just, why aren't we seeing a, an NVMe RAID product that's built around the data integrity field, this zero overhead implementations with Intel CPUs, kind of like, you know, VROC approaches zero overhead. Why is that not a thing that I can already buy? It's almost like one group inside of Intel put all this functionality under the accelerators umbrella, but then some execu lizard bean counter said, hmm, Wait, this particular scenario or that one, that results in a 10x. We should charge extra for that. Intel needs definitive messaging to say that they don't intend to monetize those features separately. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. To the execu lizards that say that they're looking to make some extra money from these features, I would say, these are not the accelerators you're looking for. To the engineers, I would say, did a damn fine job, kudos. 
you've done some really clever engineering and this is what we need for faster interfaces to our DPUs and Gaudi 2 and more stuff like that. So you engineer, you keep on keeping on and don't be discouraged. And also let me know what's up because I'm having to piece this together after the fact. Anyway, next up on this page, security extensions. Let's talk about the security accelerators. Security accelerator. Oh, it's oh software guard extensions. Oh, uh, SGX. SGX does not have a great track record, and I honestly wish I knew more about the plan here. I, this this might be the legit one where Intel missed the mark. AMD's solution here is a slick, full encrypted memory solution, full encrypted memory hardware, and it is standing up well to scrutiny. I mean. I understand it, and it's way simpler. The heavy-handed marketing on this page around SGX has some real actual foundation under it for things that are not SGX, but SGX, I don't know, it doesn't look good. Network, VRAN Boost. It's an accelerator for virtualized radio access network. That's the RAN, radio access network. This is important for, not just for cellular, but also embedded and large complex wireless networks. Think about like the robotic system in a very large scale uh, warehouse with tons of robots moving around and they're completely automated. I mean, it's, it's a little bit niche, but it's a very large lucrative niche. And there's also Open RAN and Open RAN's standard is to increase diversity and avoid vendor lock-in. And Intel's actually been careful to architect their VRAN extensions to avoid lock-in and integrate with Open RAN. But Intel doesn't really talk about Open RAN in their marketing material for their solution. I mean, I'm fine with Intel having a legit competitive advantage. Lock-in is bad when you can't switch to a competitor that has a technically superior product. The product should compete on the merits. And so Open RAN is good for all of us and VRAN will integrate with Open RAN and so it must compete on the merits. That's a good architecture. And the people that use the accelerator uh, seem to be pretty happy with it, but I need to get my hands dirty with that as well. But the marketing? Intel really doesn't tell me anything substantive. I mean, Intel completely misses talking about how the explosion of radio networks for far more than just cell uh, and Wi-Fi is driving some serious innovation. Look at Starlink. Starlink is going to bring internet to people in a way that rural fiber should have, but hasn't for the last 20 years. That's a big wireless network. Even just my turbo explanation is a lot of words to say that it doesn't really sound like that type of accelerator lends itself to you know a kind of rug pull with the math features already in the processor. So Intel's not gonna be able to charge licensing fees for that separately or unlock fees. And let's talk about IPP for a second. What's, what's IPP? Well, check out the Intel webpage about IPP. It's the Integrated Performance Privatives. It's a thing for programmers to make easy use of whatever the heck is available without having to think about it. I can be lazy, I can just import, <laughs> import thing I need, run thing I need, done. Royalty free APIs for developers. The primitives are built to make it fast and get up and running with SIMD, that's AVX 512, AMX, and other instruction sets like that, even MMX technically. Royalty free, ready to use. Now royalty free is code for the opposite of whatever Intel was talking about in that Tom's Hardware article. And hey, look at that. This is their first mention of one API. This is where some of my own confusion around accelerators has come from. You can use, for example, Quick Assist on Sapphire Rapids to do compression. Okay, that's cool. Without touching the CPU, zero overhead. You dump, dump your uncompressed data here, and you, you pick it up over here. Just like doing dry cleaning. It's really not a lot more complicated than that. There's some code on GitHub, you can go check that out. If you're more technically inclined, I definitely encourage that. QAT is a, available on a lot more than Sapphire Rapid Xeon. CPUs like Xeon D embedded. They've had that for a while, although the new generation insanely way fast. Open SSL, not completely terrible. For crypto, it's already accelerated this way. WireGuard, you wanna run QAT accelerated WireGuard on the potato class appliance, as long as it's got QAT hardware, you can totally do it. One doesn't just use QAT though in the real world. QAT is its own thing, sure. Think, think like that PCIe card built in your CPU, dry cleaning, however you wanna think about it. But like I was saying before, it does not run on a core, at least not by itself. You read in a block of data, you copy to some to memory, it does the thing. But in IPP, depending on how the developers implemented it, you may also get to leverage 
AVX512, AMX, or other hardware features that are available. Heck, you may have a PCIe add-in card. You may have Gaudi 2. You may have an Intel Arc graphics card. It will make it easier for developers to use that hardware because in your program you can say, hey, stop for a second when this program starts up and see if we've got an Arc accelerator. See if we've got a PCIe QAT accelerator. See if we've got, you know, uh, Gaudi 2. And then the program will automatically use those hardware resources. And then if a lot of people adopt Gaudi 2, well, guess what? It's going to migrate. It's going to find its way into the processor. Makes sense to me. That's how it happened with QAT. Now QAT lives in the processor. It was a PCIe card. It's not that complicated. Now, maybe, just maybe, someday, those PCIe type accelerators, maybe they'll charge extra for those. But, you know, the uh, Intel, when the Pentium first launched, way back 20, no, no 97, more than 20 years ago, there was an MMX Pentium and a non-MMX Pentium. MMX was multimedia extensions. You could vote with your wallet and you could, it's like, oh, multimedia extensions, they're new, they make multimedia faster, and then non-MMX. Guess what? Nobody bought MMX CPUs because you had to pay extra. And it didn't go away because Intel said, gosh darn it, we think it's really good. MMX is still in your processor today, but you don't pay extra for it. What about in 2023? You know, that was 20 years ago, the world's a different place. Okay, what about VROCK? VROCK is not that old. Is someone willing to pay to unlock features like memory mapped I.O. for VROCK? And the answer was no. VROCK is genuinely good engineering, but nobody adopted it because of the license key. But the important thing for this video is that for sure, AMX is there on the workstation Sapphire Rapids, and AVX512 is there. I mean, AVX512 is meant to be there on 12th and 13th generation desktop CPUs, and in case it's not clear, the Alder Lake, Raptor Lake core is basically the same as a core that's in the Xeon, and so it's like, wait, Alder Lake and Raptor Lake doesn't have AVX512, but Sapphire Rapids does? Uh-huh. I'm sure AVX512 will be back in the next generation. I'm, I'm genuinely excited about the march of technology here. This is great. More on these desktop Sapphire Rapids CPUs in my other video, W790, why you gotta be weird. So if you're curious about that, check it out. But as for IPP, it sure would be nice if there was one API. Oh, I already said that. One API, one API. It literally is one API for tying all this stuff together. Wikichips maintains a Venn diagram of AVX512. If you think that it's not complicated to do that, it's fabulously complicated to do that. AVX512, look at this diagram. It is hugely complicated. That's because there's 17 different versions of AVX512. So while the Golden Cove cores in Sapphire Rapids, server or desktop, are facing stiff competition, it still does put some pressure on AMD. They'd better not be asleep at the helm here, I think, because the accelerated results with like OpenVINO and RocksDB and the other tuned solutions that can leverage that are so, so good, even in my own testing. AMD could provide some answers to this challenge via their Pensando acquisition, which is exciting for some other reasons that have to do with very fast PCIe, and also CXL. But, you know, some folks could come out of left field with CXL accelerators as well, because CXL solves a, another computer science problem that has to do with memory coherence. And all of that is pretty exciting, because if somebody comes up with something really cool, it's going to be pretty easy to implement, not in silicon, and then later in, in CPU silicon. And now one final note, some of these accelerators like QAT can be tough to pass inside a virtual machine. So if you look at these kinds of things for hyperscalers like Amazon and others, it can be a little tough. I mean, you can take a 32 core server and split it into four eight core virtual machines so that your SQL licensing, your Microsoft SQL licensing is not awful. But if all four of those VMs try to use a QAT accelerated backup at 2 a.m. at the same time, you're gonna be in for a bad time. Now, on bare metal, if you're running an 8 or a 16 core server on bare metal, if you're running a backup, even if the server is 100% load, if it's using QAT, you're not really going to know. The IO, aforementioned IO bottleneck notwithstanding. So hopefully with an engineer at the helm of Intel, they'll keep going back to their engineering roots. Accelerators have good engineering and the potential to pay off big time for Intel. Having seen some of these possible 10x performance software improvements, by leveraging actual hardware in the CPU, some customers might actually be willing to pay extra for those types of unlocks. Certainly in the case of Microsoft SQL Server, it's gonna be cheaper. I can't wait to do our deep dive with not just one, but two Supermicro systems. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. This has been a quick look at Intel's secret weapon against AMD. Secret because the marketing is so confused that nobody knows what they actually are. It's hiding in plain sight. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. I'm signing out, you can find me in the Level One forums. Thank you.